Welcome to the Scaling Japan Podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from one hundred thousand dollars and beyond. And beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan Podcast. I'm your host Tyson Bottino, and on today's episode, we have Skylar Alexandra Cole for the third time. She is an associate at Incubate Fund, one of the largest early stage focused venture capital firms in Japan. She is also a founder of Startup Co Creation Community that aims to curate genuinely exciting opportunities, share startup knowledge, and host events for its globally minded entrepreneurs and members. We are doing a three part series on venture capital. The first episode was on understanding VCs better. The second episode was on raising money, and this episode is on pitch decks. So glad to have you on again, Skylar. Hey, Tyson, thank you so much for having me back. So, we've had a lot of great reviews for the first episode, and I think like some people even told you, like, thank God you created this type of content.、Definitely. But, like, what type of feedback have you been hearing so far? Yeah, and、no, I've been getting incredible feedback DMs, emails, just in person saying that. I've listened to the episode a couple times or three times now and really happy to kind of have some transparency. And I think that, you know, it's really thanks to you that you have this platform to share. So, really happy to be a part of that and to provide some useful information. Yeah, no, I think the information is definitely needed. I think there's a lot of information scattered,、mm-hmm. but through、yeah. our three part series, I think we can cover a lot of the common questions that people have. Yes, most definitely. Cool. So, yes,、yeah, so、I think we've discussed last time on what is a fundable company, like what type of returns VCs are looking for, and how we both, I think, agree that how startup founders understand VCs better is t just going to make it, things so much easier for them. Yes, and, most definitely.、Uh, you know, having that VC perspective in, in mind goes a long way. And so, now that they know, understand the VCs, how to find them, how to follow up with them. I think we're coming to the next big question is the pitch deck itself. I think sometimes it can seem a little maybe like, oh, just put something together, present it, but actually creating a pitch deck can pose a huge challenge and it's an ongoing process. Today we'll go through kind of how to think about different types of pitch decks and how to best prepare. Yes, I've heard some people say like it's an art form. <laughs>、mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely、so- it's an art form. So, we're trying to bridge the gap between、uh, being vague with art form and also providing some concrete solutions and best practices that founders can use. Yes, we have lots of actionable steps for you today. So, there are three types of pitch decks in general that I kind of hear the word thrown out, which are you know, the pitch contests,、uh, the email to investors, and one for the actual meeting with investors. Could you kind of tell us a little bit about each and the general differences? Absolutely. So, first, I'll talk about the pitch contest deck. And I actually consider this more of a special case because not everyone necessarily participates in a pitch contest. But the content itself kind of depends on the parameters of the pitch contest itself, whether it's two minutes, five minutes, or eight minutes, however, however long you may have. But this is typically a shorter deck that you'll present kind of live. It has the key and most appealing information about the startup. Next, There is kind of what I like to call a read deck. When I say read deck, it means that the person who you send it to can read it and the reader can fully understand the content without any explanation. Finally, we'll have kind of the deck that you will present live to investors in a meeting. This may or may not be different than your read deck, but a present deck allows you a little bit more flexibility to tell a story and use less text and really kind of. Paint a picture, especially at the earlier stages of pre seed,、um, when there's really not a lot、uh, substantial or quantitative to present. This deck kind of provides you a chance to have a little bit more creativity in the live meeting. Gotcha. And I think, yeah, they all have kind of like different purposes. I guess, kind of like my thought is the pitch contest is to get someone to reach out to you after the pitch contest、yes. while you're at that pitch event. Right, exactly. So when you're at a pitch contest, There's probably a panel of investors or judges, but also an audience full of different stakeholders and interested people who may want to engage in different ways.、So、you're absolutely right. 
which is a bit different than kind of your deck to an investor, which you want to be able to convince the investors that you are building something interesting that is potentially defensible, scalable, and to continue the conversation. And it's not exactly a pitch deck, but it's kind of similar to a pitch contest. But for the elevator pitch, Mm -hmm. I really like the format from Founder Institute. Mm, Yes, it's fantastic. I have it in front of me just so I don't forget. If you just look on Google, like Founder Institute Startup Mad Libs, and it goes, so for example, uh, my company is developing your offer to help this target audience solve this problem with this secret sauce, this solution. I think it's really good on, so like my company, the Founder Institute is developing a training and mentoring program to help target audience entrepreneurs launch and create a new startup with a meaningful and enduring technology. And the secret sauce is uh, with shared equity that encourages peer support. Mm -hmm. But I find that so many founders, they try to explain their business to you in like three to five minutes. I understand because it's their passion, but when I feel like, oh, this is, I don't know if I wanna have another conversation because they don't know how to be concise and it's gonna take too much of my time. Right, most definitely. And and it's hard as a founder, you know your business so well, you're so excited, you want to make sure you show it in the best light. But kind of from that perspective, you can often get very bogged down. And that's one reason why the Founder Institute kind of Mad Libs is so great at kind of having a really concise statement and really creating and executing on the art form of being really concise is so important. Honestly, the most important thing, because what's most important whether you have a pitch competition or elevator pitch that's 30 seconds or however long, what's most important is to be able to share about your company in a concise manner under different restraints and conditions. So that involves understanding your company and practice. It's not just enough to kind of have a sharp looking pitch or, you know, have something flashy. You have to, and you don't have to be the best presenter or most charismatic person in the world, but you need to be convincing and action, I think in this forum in the form of practice, builds confidence and allows you to be more convincing. So, yeah. So I think for the pitch contest, I think my next question is going to be like, what are some red flags? And so I think one would probably be uh, not being concise. Yes, most definitely. So I think that, and we'll talk about this a bit more, how I at least see the pitch contest deck as kind of a derivative of a much longer deck. But some of the red flags that kind of are true across types of whatever deck you're looking at is kind of missing key information or slides, irrelevant or kind of overinflated information, any typos or or I often see. And and sometimes depending on the situation, maybe you don't have time to completely go over this, but if you don't have a competitor analysis or it feels kind of incomplete or under research, those can all be kind of red flags. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what are your thoughts on the pitch deck that you send in the email to investors? I find this a bit interesting. Normally we receive just one deck and typically if you have a meeting set up, congratulations, that's a major step. You'll send that deck in advance. There's really not an expectation that you'll have kind of this re-present and kind of shorter deck. And And it also depends a bit on the style of the VC, exactly how they will use that information ahead of a meeting. But typically they'll go through it at least briefly. And then in the meeting, they'll decide whether you want to present the deck as is, have a shorter condensed summary, or just have a conversation at that point. And uh, any additional thoughts on the pitch deck for meeting with investors? Typically, you'll be meeting for maybe either 30 minutes to an hour, kind of depending on the VC. I'm going to go ahead and make the statement that, at least in this case, your read deck and your pitch deck will be the same. Really to have all your key information, and we'll kind of go through the slides in a little bit to talk about what are those key slides, but also having kind of an appendix with additional slides, maybe questions that you get that don't naturally come into the flow of your pitch deck, or any kind of technical aspects that would require maybe a little more uh, discussion and longer conversation, you can include those in the appendix of the deck. Yeah, I think you mentioned a good point. It's, let's say, the information needs to be structured. Mm -hmm for the person reading it. Yes. And sometimes just having too much data up front that just overwhelms someone's brain. And so, yeah, like I really like that you mentioned the appendix point because if the person wants that information, yes, they can check it. And I think that's kind of like the art form of getting venture capital. It's knowing what to say when. 
Yes, most definitely. And simplicity, like we keep saying, is, is an art form that takes iteration, just like your product, just like your business. Um, and something to keep in mind that VCs likely won't take a lot of time to look at your deck. I kind of think of it pretty analogous to kind of resumes. Like we've, we've all submitted a resume. The person who's looking at it probably isn't going to be reading it super carefully or spending a lot of time, partially because they do see a lot of resumes and kind of know what to look for. A similar thing applies with VCs. While I particularly like to spend more time with decks, especially those that I'm most excited about, VCs overall just get a lot of decks and to get through all the content, can't really spend a lot of time. But one other reason why uh, VCs may not take as much time uh, with the, any individual deck is partially a function of the sheer number. They see so many business models, solutions, ideas, industries, and kind of through pattern matching are able to just pick up and glean information really quickly. That's a part of the VC job to know and kind of have a broader view of what's happening, but that, that does result in kind of less time. So as a founder, I would say, you know, kind of expect a VC not to spend a lot of time, at least initially on your deck. I mean, when I was a founder, I was pretty much just running operations. So I didn't really get too many people reaching out to me because I was kind of under the radar. But now that I've put myself a lot in public, I do a lot of podcast episodes, presentations. I do get about like 10 to 15 requests a week. And like for even me, that's like, oh, it's, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. Actually, I'm curious, how often do you get pitched or receive requests? I mean, it's kind of a daily occurrence, both new requests and then just ongoing requests because decks are an iterative process. So maybe I'm looking at V5 or V10 of one deck and V1 of one constantly. So it's just a daily endeavor. But there are things you can do to kind of increase your chances of kind of viewing. And I, I'd love to kind of talk about that a little bit. Like I've been saying, kind of a, a theme throughout the series is that VCs are human and by being human kind of have similar um, challenges or things that maybe heuristics or things we, we naturally do. Um, but one thing to increase your chances is to make your message really clear. This make kind of sound odd, but don't make the VCs think. Lay it out clearly so there are fewer questions that can maybe get them bogged down and allow you to really show your company in the best light. So make everything as crystal clear and succinct as possible. And like we keep saying, master the art of simplicity. And in doing so, really creating an overall style and a feel, because even the perception of poor readability can be a deterring factor. Keep it clear and then always check because typos stand out easily and you don't want things like that to get bogged down. VCs may not necessarily care. Any individual VC may not care as much about that, but you don't want any of those factors to get in the way of presenting your idea and moving forward with the conversation. Yeah, and I would like, to add a little bit of a follow-up to, it also comes to that situation where the demand for VC money mm -hmm. is much greater than the supply of time mm -hmm. that VCs have to actually contribute to each individual company. And myself included, like first I thought like, you know, VC capital firms, they're super rich. Like they have tons of HR, <laughs> they have tons of staff, they have tons of money for it. But Actually, I think there's only like 2% of the fund. And I think that 2% is for like five to 10 years, right? Yeah, the two, the two and 20. The demand is greater than the supply. So that's why VCs, they kind of have to come up with shortcuts. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you're completely right. And I think that a part of that is developing that muscle as a VC. And sometimes, but VCs can sometimes be wrong. We are not perfect. So some things, you know, allow through pattern matching allows to make great decisions, but at the same time you can miss things. So I think also that's just to say that you know, even if a VC doesn't pick you, that doesn't necessarily mean your idea is bad. VCs mix great deals all the time. But a part of kind of the building of the muscle and the skill set for VC is kind of building this pattern matching. I mean you could just be unlucky as well. The chances are low, but there's that possibility. So it's kind of like an endurance race mm -hmm. and just training yourself. The other point I wanted to make was, I think with a lot of VCs as well, especially the junior VCs where they're kind of the gatekeepers in some ways, you have to go through them. Mm -hmm. A lot of their cases too, like the demand for their time is greater than their ability to manage time because yeah. there's just so much demand. And so like because of that, they're looking for shortcuts. And so like even with a spelling error or like if they didn't understand something, like I think how you mentioned, like don't create friction. If they can't understand something and they're in this really stressful environment, 
where they're kind of like in a fight or flight response, mm -hmm. high pressure, is like, are they going to fight and try to understand that point you're communicating? Or are they just going to okay. run away and let's move on to something simpler? Yes, definitely. No, there's the time and the mental space uh, for any individual assessing stacks and startups. It's definitely a huge component of it. And like you said, kind of reducing tension is so important because if there's something you don't understand, like you said, any one person may or may not look further into it or they may see something and kind of turn them off and keep moving. And whether that's material, I don't say it doesn't matter, but it, it does factor into the assessment, even just in the time allotted for any one deck. So you're absolutely right about that. Cool. Sorry for the listeners if I keep beating on on that point, but for founders to understand that, I think it's a really key component. And now that you kind of understand the VC better, I think it might also help to reduce your stress because not knowing what the VC is going through also provides you a lot of stress. Yes. Yes. I think it can help kind of streamline your thinking and what's most important when getting ready. So yeah, I think we covered it, but yeah, just want to reiterate. Uh, so I guess how much time does VCs typically have to spend on pitch decks? Let's say I've maybe reviewed a pitch deck and I take it to my team, kind of spend only a few seconds kind of going through each slide. Um, and maybe if it's something interesting, we'll take more time, kind of go back. But really, I would say in any one kind of assessment, just a few seconds to take in what's on the slide. One of the common challenges I see with my consulting clients is not having any staff internally who can drive marketing strategy and execution to the next level. This really limits the growth trajectory of a company, especially for a leader like you that wants to go from 30 million to 500 million yen a year and does not have the time to spend years learning through trial and error. To solve this problem, I'm launching a marketing agency that can help companies like yours to increase leads and closing rates through SEO, Google Maps, content marketing, and websites that convert. Head over to scalingyourcompany.com and book a free consultation. Let's talk about what your business needs are, where your current strategy is letting you down, and how we can help you see real results with the methods I've successfully implemented at multiple companies myself. Now, back to the episode. So we talked a little about the red flags, but uh, are there any differences in Japanese VCs' expectations? Well, actually, I think this is kind of a part of a theme I'm seeing across pitch deck types is that while I'm biased because I'm looking for teams that are globally ready or, or can have global potential, I think there's actually more of a convergence in what a good deck is. And I think that's is converging on a more globally, kind of on the global standard for pitch decks. Now, I don't think that's necessarily the expectation yet overall in the ecosystem. And of course, it depends on kind of the VC. Overall, I'd say it's the expectation isn't to have like a Silicon Valley well-designed deck, but I do think that's where things are headed. Um, and this is especially important as companies look to grow and secure capital from foreign investors, because that's given the growth capital dynamics here, that's often required um, unless you decide to IPO early or IPO kind of in under normal conditions. Um, but it's also important as you look to potentially pursue exits on foreign exchanges. Any other thoughts about, I guess, the pitch deck? for the pitch contest? Well, actually, I would love to provide a great example um, and shout out another great startup podcast. But on This Week in Startups, they've recently started doing a pitch competition. Uh, so from Jason Calacanis's Accelerator, um, they pick some that have completed the program for the chance to win $25K. <laughs> And I have to say they're all the there are two minute presentations, but really all the presenters present very, very well. And they're great examples for someone who's looking to kind of shape a more concise presentation. I really feel that they're informative, tight and don't feel rushed. So I would say definitely kind of check out those. The episodes are in like late March and April. I think there are currently three episodes as of this recording with two to four pitches per episode across industries, business models, what have you. So I highly recommend listening and taking note. It's two minutes. And of course, maybe your individual pitch deck will vary. But I think those are great examples to kind of listen to and kind of hear the practice and both see the presentation, but also the type of decks that they present. So I highly recommend that. I think that's a great resource. Like in my case, when I was learning about, let's say, doing pitches, I would just watch random shows of people pitching for like an hour. Yeah. Like they would have a pitch contest show and you would have random people. But with the recommendation you give, they're just listening to the best. Yes, they're very high quality. 
So yeah, I mean, of course, it's it helps to hear different types of itches and see what's good and what's bad. But these are all really, really top notch. And I've noticed too, like when I'm doing a kind of like pitch events for a 500 Global and Founder mm-hmm. Institute, when the other founders hear a really good pitch, yes, like everybody knows it. It's obvious. It's so obvious. Absolutely, you're 100 percent right. <laughs> So it'd be funny sometimes people would be like, Sugoi. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I, I've been in rooms and Zooms exactly like that. And I think the thing is, you don't have to naturally be the most charismatic or baseline, most, you know, just comfortable speaking, but you can practice that. You can recognize that. You can start to implement and add your own style to it, of course. But um, those are things you can practice and really get better at. And uh, anything else regarding a uh, pitch contest? Overall, with creating pitch decks, there are a lot of components that can slow down founders. I would say for the pitch contest, more so than kind of what you need to prepare for any one pitch competition, it's just to be able to really talk about your business and know your business well. So whether you have 30 seconds or five minutes, you can talk and be comfortable including things or taking things out. I keep saying practice, 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 but just because you have your deck doesn't mean you're ready to present it. So I would just say, keep practicing. You already know your business the best out of anyone, but really having the understanding and being able to articulate that is just so important. So I'd say, you know, of course, if you do have an upcoming pitch event, you want to prepare for those parameters, but overall, just being able to be comfortable talking about your company is invaluable. And let's move on to diving deeper, a little bit more into the pitch deck to Mm -hmm. investors. You did briefly mention some things like the overall red flags, but mm-hmm. yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about maybe some potentially other red flags for the email to investors? I'm so glad you mentioned that because the actual kind of outreach investor is, I don't say equally as important, but extremely critical. And even your tone and kind of the respect uh, you show in that message can make a huge difference. Because I think, of course, you want to be confident about what you're building and excited about what you're building, but you also don't want to be cocky and come off as maybe potentially hard to work with or maybe, I want to say, arrogant. But really in your outreach, you want to keep the message succinct and kind of have highlights, but really your tone and having understanding of the VC and reflecting that in your message are all things that can really uh, make you stand out. Maybe it's not obvious to kind of take that approach, but it really makes a big difference. Sometimes I get uh, founders who are doing something related to like SDGs, Mm -hmm. uh, let's say sustainability. And I feel sometimes when they reach out to me, they come up with a holier than thou approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a common thing? I definitely understand that situation. I think it's part of a function of kind of being in startups in a way. I, I don't think it's inherently has to be part of it. You want people with big ideas, big visions. But you also don't want to necessarily oversell or kind of put what you're doing on a pedestal, kind of grounding it in some reality and balancing your big vision is important. So I definitely think that I I know the types of messages you're talking about, but it's really, I think, about this balance, whether it's kind of a values-based or socially minded um, venture or kind of just a more in one of your typical startups. So balancing this big vision and actually what you're doing to solve it. Yeah, I think that's uh, really great feedback. It's it's really hard to actually do in practice. Yes, but, it is challenging. But no, I think that's uh, great feedback. And that's part of the practice and iteration, seeing what lands with people. So they may sound great to you and may make complete sense to someone else, depending on their familiarity with the topic or just their personality. It may not resonate. So just having that awareness and as you practice your pitch, not just to yourself, but to other people, you'll kind of get to understand what components really land with people. I'm kind of hoping with this episode, uh, a lot of the art form elements, it's hopefully it can give enough information where people can get some tips. But I think that point you mentioned where it is a reiterative process. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Let's say you're preparing for your pre-seed round. That deck will go through so many different versions. And even when you present it the first few times, maybe you'll go back to the drawing board and change some things. And that's okay. A pitch deck isn't a static document. It's it's alive. It's changing. And we'll talk about some things to include in, in just a little bit uh, more concretely. But don't be afraid to iterate. And don't be afraid to kind of move forward with a pitch deck you have. Because I think a lot of founders get really stuck and don't want to share it or present it with the world. But you need to have something while also being open to kind of this iterative process. 
Yeah, I think if anyone takes anything from this episode, I think I actually think that's the key point. Yeah, this is valuable. So I guess kind of moving on with the email to investors, do you have any other thoughts? It also depends on exactly who you're reaching out to. But I think across the board, just being really respectful, uh, showing your knowledge of the VC, um, kind of what your expectations are, just being really clear about that in your email. Don't go overboard because like a very verbose, text-heavy, or kind of hard-to-read deck, no one's really going to want to read a really long, verbose email. Um, but really kind of what the appetite and show enthusiasm and highlights. And I think that's a great uh, initial message. So I think probably the listener is asking themselves right now is, what is your preferred length, Skylar? Yeah, I mean, I think that maybe three kind of succinct paragraphs, maybe a three lines each, kind of just something that's easy to take in, something that still feels like, oh, I can just kind of read this quickly. Anything more than that, I don't think is necessary. And I think part of it, you don't have to put everything, like all the information inside this email. Really, you just want to get kind of get to the next step to what the appetite to start a conversation. And actually, maybe having a message that's too long can be a hindrance to that. But if, also, if it's too short, then maybe it feels a little like you didn't put in enough effort telling the investor who you are, what you're building, and kind of what you would like to do moving forward, open to a conversation, set of meeting, check out my deck what have you, that's really all you need to include. Uh, so I want to clarify. So kind of what you meant by stating your expectations is uh, mm-hmm. if you'd like them to check your deck and give you feedback or if you're looking to have a meeting, could you kind of clarify like on, let's say, stating the expectations? Yes, most definitely. I may have mentioned this in an earlier episode, but it can be hard to respond to someone when there's not a clear ask. Just because, like we keep saying, there's a lot the VCs are trying to do any one day. So saying that if this is interesting, we'd love to set up a 30-minute meeting to talk further and kind of share more about what we're building. Or if it's something like, I'm not actively looking to raise, but I would love to start a conversation, maybe get some advice on how to prepare to raise. This is also a clear ask. And I think if you're talking to maybe an associate or you know someone like myself, I think there's a little bit more flexibility to be like, I would just love to start a conversation. Could, would you be willing to give me feedback? If you're at a partner level, hopefully you've kind of had some type of conversation, but we, you get cold emails all the time asking for meeting or asking to check things out. But yeah, just some, either asking for a time, asking for feedback, just something concrete that whoever you're sending it to can easily respond to. There's this communication principle called the Minato principle. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, it sounds like a Japanese word, but actually it's not. Mm-hmm. It might be Italian, but... The TLDR is <laughs> when you want someone to do something or you want to make a request, you start off with the request, then you provide the details afterwards. So what I mean, the opposite is you'll put all those types of information and at the end, you'll make your request. Yeah. And what doesn't work about that? The person, while they're reading that information, this is for Westerners. Right. But right. Uh, So this is a communication style if you're approaching a Western VC in Japan or in the West. But you should start off with your requests, then the information afterwards. So when they look at the information afterwards, they have a basis of why they're reading yeah. this support information. Absolutely. No, that's incredible advice. Tell them what you want. Tell them to me and tell them again what you want at the end to remind them. Otherwise, you're just, they're just going to be so, OK, this paragraph one this paragraph two yeah what what do they want <laughs> where, where are we going with this and so this is something that i teach all of my employees and i also coach other business leaders on as well is mm. for dealing business in the west I highly recommend the minato principle mm-hmm. and even when i've dealt with japanese startups they typically like this a communication approach as well because they're busy I guess my last one would be any thoughts on diving a little bit deeper for the pitch deck for meetings with investors? Well, I was definitely trained in my first um, VC role to kind of have this read and and present deck. And kind of depending on your particular startup, kind of what that story is and what that framing is can change. And I think that, you know, if you have a present deck, there's an opportunity, like I said, to tell a story and maybe take the perspective of maybe your core customer or your target customer really bring it to life. So let's say Anne has X problem or she's doing Y, kind of present the situation and take the investors on a journey. 
um, which is something that you can do when you're presenting in live versus with the a read deck. The slides are pretty much the same. It's really just the framing, but you don't want to have kind of a read deck, the story that makes it hard to understand what you're talking about. But content's overall the same, but kind of when you're presenting live, paying the story, making it really concrete, kind of what situation this is applicable towards, what problem you're trying to solve, and kind of what people are already doing now. Having a story, I mean, we, we are humans, we love storytelling. So that is one way to kind of approach uh, a presentation deck that's a bit different than if you just have kind of your read deck. For me, I think probably yeah, the big point you mentioned was using an appendix, mm -hmm. like how important that is. Yes, definitely. Because you want to tell a succinct story or have a succinct presentation. And kind of at the earlier stages, maybe there's just not a lot. There's typically not as much to say, but there are things maybe about the business model, the market, your team or your product or what have you that are worth going into detail. And just having that as a reference, because during the Q&A, maybe there's something that investors are particularly interested in. If you have a slide already, that's really strong um, and are ready to kind of handle those questions. So the appendix, keep all the things that you maybe you're worried about needing to cover, have it there and you're really good to go. Thank you very much. We talked briefly about it last time. And thank you for finding uh, that post on LinkedIn. Hey, I love this. It's one of my favorite posts. What we're referring to is a great reference post by Paul O'Brien, which was posted on LinkedIn. And we'll have it in the episode description. But Paul O'Brien is the CEO of Media Tech Ventures, founder and director of Funded House, and the director of Founder Institute in the U.S., and basically, it's, this is a matrix of six major venture capital firms globally, and then for, for the headers, and then kind of for each row is a different slide that may or may not be included in these top either venture capital firms or famous startups like Airbnb. And it's kind of just a dot to show whether it's included, if it's included across all instances. And there's also great commentary in his post connected. Oh, with yeah. This. And I guess really what I like cool. about it is founders are kind of bombarded with so many methodologies on uh, what should be on a pitch deck. Yes. And unfortunately, there is no one clear format. Like it's not like a government form where there's only right. one form. And they try to put that together. It's so like all these influential VCs or authorities on pitch decks. And they found what are the common themes. And it also shows for this common point, like, for example, like market validation or why now, mm -hmm. which of these pitch decks include that slide? I love sharing this with people. And I do just want to note before we kind of dive into this more, that this is an extremely strong starting point, but you don't have to feel like you have to follow this 100% or figure out the magic code hidden in all these dots and figure out what's perfect. Use this as a guide, but make sure you include what's necessary to your startup, which may be different than your friend's startup or someone else you've seen. Typically, think each slide, each topic has one slide, but don't be afraid to take one or two slides for clarity um, to keep the slides easy to understand. I say all this to say that this is a great resource, but there's also some flexibility depending on kind of your judgment and what fits your startup the best. Unfortunately, they all recommend between 10 to 15 slides. But there are only six slides which these six agree on. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so you have to make a judgment call on yes. the other remaining slides you're going to use. Yes, most definitely. So it's a, a bit of a challenge. But I think if you stay true to what's the essential information for your startup, that can guide you on what to include. Thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Japan. In addition to serving as your fine host, I also provide advisory and coaching services to business owners who want to 2x, 5x, and even 10x their business. So stop holding your company and your team and your employees back and let me help you and your company scale. Find more information at scalingyourcompany.com. Now back to the episode. Yeah, if we want to go through kind of some of these sure. key slides and some notes about each one. Now, I would love to kind of make a few notes on the type of slides that are included in this matrix and just some things I think you should keep in mind when you're building your deck and also just kind of building your company, especially when you're first starting out. So first, we'll look at problem. You need to be solving a problem. This actually can be a bigger challenge. I think there's a saying that says, fall in love with the problem and not the solution. And so I may be excited about, about what you're building. At the end of the day, you may need to make sure that you are solving a problem that exists, 
a problem that's actually painful and one that those affected are actively looking for a solution. And so without those components, then maybe you're building a nice to have, or maybe you're building something that's more of an SME, uh, which is maybe not targeting such a, a scalable problem, but having these three components and being really clear about that, even with kind of your big vision is essential. So without this, you really can't start to build the rest of your company. So next across the board, uh, there's a solution value proposition and related to the problem in making sure that you're targeting something painful for your solution and value prop, you actually need to create value. It's nice to have something that works, but you have to be creating some sort of incremental value in the world. I also want to note for market size, kind of moving down, I feel often with founders and some presentations, at least initial presentations that I see, that founders want to show kind of the biggest market possible. Um, I actually find that that's not so impressive. It's important to go for a large enough total addressable market or TAM. But what's essential is what you can actually attain. And of course, you need to have some market that's maybe some billion dollar US, you know, USD market. But there's an argument to be made that there's an opportunity to dominate or take a larger portion of a smaller market or take a relatively small portion of a large market. It really depends on your solution. So not just going for the biggest market or even if it's of the biggest market you can find isn't necessarily the best strategy. That can be a starting point, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure it's relevant and you have a strong argument for a market that you can reasonably attain in, in the upcoming years. Before it's pretty much just what is the TAM, the total addressable market. But now I think, I can't remember the three, but it's TAM, yeah, SOM, SOM. SAM and SOM. SAM is total is serviceable available oh, yes, market addressable. Yes. is serviceable obtainable market. I was a bit surprised kind of how ubiquitous I saw these terms in kind of more recent pitches and pitch competitions. I don't always necessarily see these in the deck, but I think the idea is right. You have to be able to show what you can reasonably obtain. And that's what's encapsulated by the SAM and the SOM. Yeah, I think kind of one aspect too, like especially if it's a, kind of like a first time founder. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I would definitely bring up the service addressable market. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So you definitely want to have a big vision and big potential, but being obtainable and having a strategy for that is essential. And kind of on that, talking about your business model, for your business model, I want to highlight that it's not just about how you're generating revenue, but what costs are incurred. So you want to make sure that you're not taking on absorbent costs, especially early on or or for when there's a potential potentially lower cost solution. It's not just the revenue component, but the cost component is essential in kind of presenting your business model. And then a slide that is actually maybe a little bit, I don't want to say contested, but I think half of the firms and the startups included mm-hmm. include this, but your special sauce or underlying magic. I'm a fan of a special sauce uh, slide, but this is something that can actually be woven into your team page or your business model. But what's really important here is to show that you have some unique insight, ability, and or experience that positions you to uniquely successfully target the problem and the market that you're aiming to address. So for the competition slide, I've mentioned this before, but I'll just reiterate this because maybe this is a bit of a personal pet peeve of mine, but don't say there's no competition. That's pretty invalidating. And of course, you know, we're looking for novel ideas and solutions. But I think it's pretty hard to say that there's not any competition for most ideas. If you say there isn't any competition, it kind of reads as you maybe didn't put in enough work to find the competition or you have some blind spots. Because there's always some company that is relevant in some way, even if it's just a partial overlap. So I think similarly to how maybe having a large market size can be a bit of an inadvertent pitfall kind of this competition slide can also be a bit of an inadvertent because while you think you're actually presenting something in a great light, but it may not come off as you intended. Probably the initial response would just be doubt. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You want to be reasonable. It's this confidence, but kind of this grounded, more reasonable tension that you have to always keep in mind. And when you have so little time with an investor, with an audience, you don't want to kind of be adding any unnecessary doubt because you will have questions. You will um, have to conduct, you know, go through due diligence, but anything you can do to just de-risk and not so doubt is really important. 
to wrap up this slide by slide, but when you're talking about the team, like I mentioned, this is an opportunity to show your special sauce, but through your team slides, you really want to validate that you're the right people uh, to tackle the problem and really show kind of this founder market fit. Uh, depending on the structure of, of your deck, maybe this comes in earlier, maybe you are able to have some more casual conversation about this at some point during your meeting, but really showing that you are the right team is really the purpose of this team slide. And I hope that really focuses how you present you know, your past experiences or any kind of content that you want to include about your team, no matter the size. And then finally, to talk about a bit of the fundraising plan and use of proceeds, you want to be clear and make sure that the use of proceeds will allow you to accomplish your milestones to get to the next funding round. This is something we emphasized in a previous episode, but you don't want to take on so much money that you aren't able to actually execute and meet expectations. So when you talk about your, your use of proceeds, you want to be clear and specific as to how this will allow you to get to the next round or the next stage. Actually, as I was taking a look at this list, what I really like about the six that they have in common, the problem, solution, value proposition, business model, competition, founding team, fundraising. I think these are, if you're a first time founder, these are all things that need to be included. Mm -hmm. And I think it's things that won't initially kind of create doubt. So what I mean by it could be my personal bias, but when I see first time founders talk about market size, that's one side that kind of creates doubt for me. Other ones like uh, go to market strategy. If it's a first time founder, I'm like, yeah, actually, do they know how to do a go to market strategy? That creates doubt for me. And like advisors, uh, usually I have doubt, like, are they actually really involved? And so that's why I like a lot of these six, I think uh, you can't go wrong with them. Yes. And I think that you make a great point because sometimes I see that maybe if founders are trying to put a lot of information and in, just try to give you everything you could possibly need to be convincing. But I think with these slides that are included kind of across the board, through those slides, especially at the pre-seed seed stage, they can often be sufficient to at least continue the conversation or into peak interest. So I think that sometimes maybe with your board or advisors, it can be included to, let's say, maybe make up for something else. But at the end of the day, the extra information isn't going to kind of mask any clear areas of improvement. So I think definitely having these key slides and making them strong and succinct and simple is really the core of your initial decks. Uh, would you have any other tips for either maybe second time founders or first time founders when it comes to the pitch deck? Yes. Well, something I often recommend is to kind of forget about the visuals for a moment and really just make sure each slide has a clear message and refine that first before you go back and kind of make it look nice, add your graphs, what have you. So I think if your core message is strong, you'll be able to articulate that. But if you kind of get too weighted down on, oh, I have to make this look nice, which it should look nice, but a nice looking presentation with all the tools and templates there are now isn't going to mask kind of any areas of doubt. So really going through and making sure that's clear and iterating on that is advice I give across the board. Even sometimes if you have a deck that you've been using, kind of being able to take that step back, kind of reconfigure your brain and start fresh and seeing what's essential is a great exercise, even if you don't maybe redo your entire deck. I think that's great feedback. I do a similar thing when I create sales pamphlets or websites for people as well. Like rather than actually design it, I actually write like in text. So let's say it's the, the first, the hero shot, they call it. So what is the goal of this hero shot? Mm -hmm. What is the goal of the second, the second row, the third row? And I write it out in text. And once I've clarified that vision in text, that's when I actually go and design it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's such a solid strategy and just, I think a good practice with whatever you're trying to create. Yep. Start with the goal. Yeah, start with the goal. And we've talked about it in a few instances and kind of for specific cases, but you want to show as a startup that you have an idea that's scalable, defensible, and that you and your current team can execute on at least your initial claims or have the skills to be able to give your best shot and pivot if necessary. So building that confidence, convincing investors of that is really the goal of the pitch deck. It's not to tell every your, whoever you're talking to every single thing about your company, but it's to start to convince or at least start to give investors confidence that those things are true and to continue the conversation. 
Thank you very much, Skylar. Is there anything you would like to promote or any uh, final words for the listeners? Yeah, so as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about pitch decks um, and really understand uh, how kind of trying it can be to refine your deck on top of doing all the other things you have to do as a founder and as an early stage team. But um, that's something I help uh, companies with kind of on the side. So if you're interested in just working with me or having a conversation, I'm happy to go through your pitch deck, kind of have some conversation, talk things out. So definitely feel free to reach out to me for that. As well, always promoting SCC is a place to kind of share and be with other startup tech people um, and really be able to uh, just have a safe space to ask questions, get help, and also have some fun at our events. So those two things, if you're interested, please feel free to reach out and join the community. And yeah, we'll have a link in the show note. I actually have a promotion for you too. It's a, I would definitely recommend checking out the other episodes with Skylar if you haven't yet. And I uh, actually recommend checking it in the order of one, two, and three. Thank you so much, Skylar. Hey, Tyson, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.